welcome to Marking the Spot. This is a workshop on heritage registration in Nova Scotia, both for folks who have registered properties and folks who are thinking of registering properties. Um, I will say for one more time, and then I'll leave it up to Sam to say in the chat. Um, we're going to be doing questions and answers in the chat, and um, you can also use the Q&A function on Zoom, whichever you're more comfortable with. Um, and that'll allow it. And then at the end, we'll go through those questions because I'm sure there'll be some overlap as well from what folks are folks want to know. Um, I'm going to switch to my first housekeeping page. So I'm Emma Lang. I'm the executive director of the Heritage Trust. As some of you may know, this is a new position. I've been here since April um, and I'm a full time staff member at the trust, which means that if you call the office now, you'll get someone to pick up the phone and answer questions or point you in the right direction um, and checks the email regularly and all that good stuff. And a lot of my job involves doing support work for folks who are working with heritage structures and, and built heritage across the province. My background is I've been in the museum world since I started as a volunteer when I was 14 years old working at the historic houses in Concord, Massachusetts, and I have a master's in museum studies, as well as a master's in folklore from Memorial University. So um, while I am been mostly, most of my career has been sent in the um, museum world, um, I think I'm reasonably qualified to talk about built heritage given that most of the museums I've worked in were in heritage structures as well as having played with folklore um, a good deal. And I've been in Atlantic Canada now for nine years. So that's who I am. So this is an overview workshop. Our plan is to do this workshop every year in the middle of winter when it's too cold and no one wants to go anywhere. And then over the course of the next few summers, our hope is to take it on the road. What that means is that these winter sessions will focus on a province-wide basis, and then we'll be able to go on the road um, to the different regions of the province and be able to really delve into some of the issues that are specific to that region. So I'm happy to talk about specific community issues, obviously, today, but just so you know, we're going to try and cover everybody today, so I'm not going to necessarily be delving into the bylaws of East Hants at this point, though if you have questions, we can, we can see what we can do. Um, that also allows us to have some in-person, but also allows us to run this, run this workshop more. So this is the first workshop, so we'll see how it goes. It's a bit of a the first pancake. Hopefully you all will take the time to respond to our evaluation questionnaire. I have with me um, Sam, who is our co-op student from the Dow Planning Program, who's helping, and he'll be putting various links that I reference, including the link to our evaluation in the chat. Um, so that we can hear back from you about what you think of all of this. I do talk fast. Um, please, if somebody needs me to talk slower, turn on your camera and wave at me and tell me I'm talking, I go like this, I will slow down. It's the problem with being from New England and then living in Newfoundland for too long. It just, you just ramp up slowly over time. Um, all righty. So this is our agenda for the evening, and let's get started. For those of you who don't know, the Heritage Trust of Nova Scotia has been around for 63 years, and we've been involved in all kinds of things from trying to, to from preserving the historic properties, um, to working on registration of buildings across the province, as well as doing educational programs and tours and all kinds of things. Um, we also work with government and other um, nonprofit organizations across the province and across the country. Um, and, and we take on interns and help train um, heritage professionals and folks who work in affiliated fields um, through co-op placements with us, like Sam. So I'm going to say something which is going to make some of you feel very, very old. So my apologies in advance. A heritage building is a building that is 50 years or older. So that means if it was built in 1972, it's a heritage building. This is the definition that is sort of generally applied by folks who work with built heritage around the world. This is not saying that every her every building is created equally. We don't really do a aesthetic or value judgment. That's not our job. But if you're talking about what a heritage building is in the most simple form, that's it. It can be from the time of the dinosaurs up till 1972. So that means that places that you might not think of as heritage buildings, such as Scotia Square, are actually heritage buildings. A lot of um, 
buildings that we think of as very modern are actually now cycling into into the point of heritage into being considered heritage buildings. The 50 years or older definition is also the ones that most forms of government use as sort of a baseline in terms of registration. It's the it's a year they often keep in the back of their minds. So it is useful to keep that date in mind that it's 50 years ago. Um, and they all matter. Um, they all matter because they all tell different stories. Scotia Square is a really interesting story if you think about what was going on in, in Halifax in the 70s, which some of you I'm sure remember far better than I do. Um, you know, these are these are buildings that really def shape who we are as a place and and shape and and shape our history. Um, and also just because it's modern and you might think it's ugly doesn't make it not green. The more we are able to use buildings that already exist, the better we can do for the environment. So thinking about these office buildings, this is something that's come up in the news that some of you have heard is how do we take office buildings that maybe aren't being used so much after the pandemic and and, and use them put new uses? That all is something you really have to think about some of these more modern buildings for. So it doesn't matter, 50 years, that's the, that's the number to keep in mind in the back of your head. Okay, so moving along. Of course, it's not that simple, right? There are heritage buildings, which is any building that's 50 years old, and then there's registered versus not registered. So registered heritage buildings and registration can happen on the municipal, provincial, or federal level. The general rule of thumb is that the exterior of the building is protected. The building is protected from immediate demolition. Nova Scotia has this quirky little clause that's very unique across Canada, which means that after three years of ownership, you can demolish it um, if it's municipally registered. There are a bunch of grants available, and usually their registered buildings are celebrated with a plaque. If you have a heritage building, so a building 50 years or older, that is not registered. There is very few um, funding available. There's very little funding available. Basically, it's the same funding you can get for you know putting in a heat pump. Um, there's nothing specific um, generally for buildings that are heritage but not registered. And of course, it's at high. Those buildings are at higher risk for demolition because there's absolutely no nothing to stop them. So the first question we're going to talk about is why register. Um, this is a really big question, and we know that in a lot of communities, thanks to some of our, our community our, our community reps, um, as well as what we hear from other folks in the heritage community, that there is uh, um, that the buildings are people are trying to deregister. So I think it's really important to talk about why we register. And the most the first, and we're going to go through a few reasons, but the first one is that the registration, you preserve the story of the structure and through that, the broader stories of the community. So the way I like to think about it is that it's like a, a drop of water in a lake and each building is that initial drop. And then they create these concentric circles that go out and overlap. And what you wind up with is this wonderful overlapping who, these overlapping circles that slowly tell all the different complex stories of a community. So the stories of industry and the stories of individuals and the stories of architecture and the stories of farming and the stories of the fishery. And these buildings are this way that we can, that we can engage with them. Buildings and physical things are something that people people engage with. We engage with it on a very innate level. And there's, I could go into many academic tales of this, both from the use of touch in museums and the importance of that to why people keep grandma's quilt or people keep their wedding dress even though they only wore it once and they haven't looked at it in a very long time. And buildings are the same as that. They tell us things, they connect with us on an emotional level, even if you've never seen that building and you're just driving by. They have a really deep impact on us as humans. And so at each of these buildings, you know, there is the, the story of the building, right? There's its architecture, how it was built, who lived there. And then from that, we can also start to connect with what it was, what types of buildings are around, who was there, what was life like then. And then if you go further out, 
it tells you songs, it can give you these buildings connect you to the buildings that were nearby and what was going on there and what's the same and what's different. So all of those allow us to tell this very complex story of our very complex province and our very complex community. And it can be complex on both the micro and the macro level. So those stories are really one of the most important reasons to register is because it gives us a way to share those stories and preserve those buildings so those stories can continue to be told through the physical presence of that building. The next reason is that um, by registering a heritage, a building as a heritage property, it protects the building from demolition. As I mentioned, um, according to the provincial acts around built heritage, if a building is registered at the municipal level, not at the provincial level, but at the municipal level, um, they there is the option for it to be torn down after three years. However, from when the newest owner, once an owner has owned it for three years. However, um, that is just a clause. It doesn't mean it necessarily happened. And it still does provide a certain level of protection. And obviously, if you're registering a building that you own, you're not going to necessarily tear it down in three years. Um, but registering protects them from demolition. And we know that by protecting the buildings from demolition, we are doing things that benefit the environment. There is a huge amount of data that has been done by people who are far more scientifically inclined than I am that demonstrates that through carbon capture, older buildings by virtue of their age are much greener than newer buildings. That includes buildings where they might have leaky windows and leaky doors and all of that. They are still greener because the materials have been around for longer. You've already paid to have them trucked there or taken there by horse cart or whatever it may be. So ensuring protecting older buildings and ensuring they keep being used and reused is really important and registering helps ensure that demolition doesn't happen and these buildings don't wind up in the trash the same way that you you know you you sort your regular recycling we want to think of our buildings as objects that can be recycled and reused as well and that they're they can change for like what how you use them can change and they can adapt to what needs to happen but that 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 we do keep that then there is the heritage glow. And I've got to say, I felt really clever when I found this picture of Lunenburg glowing in the, in the sunset or the sunrise. So heritage glow is that when you have heritage buildings, um, lovely economists who are better at math than I am have done lots of research and gone out and seen that actually they, they there's an economic benefit to this um, to having heritage buildings. And we know that in Nova Scotia better than a lot of places because we see that heritage structures increase tourism. We see that in when there's a neighborhood with a lot of heritage buildings, and I'm sure a lot of you just know this through your daily life, it increases the amount of time people want to spend there, going to stores, shopping in the neighborhood, hanging out with their friends, going on walks with their family, engaging in the community in whatever way they want to. It also increases the property values um, in that neighborhood. There's been some really, really amazing research that shows that, you know, even if a build, even if a neighborhood is mixed, so there are modern buildings and older buildings, those modern buildings still are in still benefit from that heritage glow. But in order to have that heritage glow, we have to keep those heritage buildings. The next reason to register is one that I mentioned briefly, which is that registered buildings are eligible for a bunch of grants. And these include grants from organizations like us. Sam is going to post our list of grants in the chat um, that has a bunch of grants that these the buildings that are registered are eligible for. And they include grants from everything from fixing the roof um, to getting making your building physically accessible, so adding a ramp or making changes to make your building greener. So on top of other available funds, you might be able to get um, and get grants that help you get windows that are tighter or increase your insulation. Um, these all connect to any renovations, of course, have to follow certain rules that we'll get into later. But there's a huge amount of money available to registered buildings. And that's really fantastic um, because that means that this money is largely coming from government and it shows that government at all levels is really committed to these buildings. 
Um, so, and who doesn't want money to help fix up your house? And organizations like ours, we actually give grants not to non, not just to nonprofits, but to individuals as well. So um, this isn't just about the nonprofit and, and the registration of a museum building or a school building or an institution. It's, it can be for your home. The benefits can be for your home as well. I'm just cheating to see what's coming next. <laughs> and lastly, most communities give you a, a, a damn fine, nice looking plaque to go on your wall. You don't have to have your plaque. Um, you can always not have your plaque hung if you don't want it, but most, most communities do let you brag about the fact that you're registered. And here are some of the examples from across the province that I found. Um, And I listen, Kevin Barrett, who some of you know, who's our provincial Bill's Heritage Officer, told me there was great debate when, when HRM was created as to what color to change the Halifax plaque to. And the green it was Kevin's suggestion. So if you like the green colored plaque, you can thank Kevin the next time you talk to him. He's quite proud of that accomplishment. <laughs> Solving problems every day. So. You want to register your building. What comes next? I'm sure that's why some of you are here. The most important thing to remember is that this is all about telling a story. And I know we have at least one or two folklorists listening in who will be able to tell you that tale is a very important type of folklore. And this is really about telling the story of your building. And the story can be a big story or it can be a little story. Um, but you need to sort of say that this building has a story and this is why that story matters. If you are applying for registration on a municipal level, you're going to put your story in the frame of your municipality, why the story, the story of how it connects to the municipality. If you're talking about the province, you're going to be for provincial registration, you're going to be talking about provincial significance. And I'm going to not leave the federal registration for another day because it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, but it would similarly be a national story you'd be looking to tell. Um, and those stories can be the same if you're applying for both, or they could be different. But that is the most, the beginning, that is really what you are demonstrating when you apply for registration. So what kinds of stories are we talking about? I can see a few people's faces. I'm hoping they can tell me that I'm not going too quickly. Um, so one of the ones that is obviously the architectural story. So why is the architecture of the building important? Is it unique? This is the only building with these details. This is the only building that was built in this way. It's the only building that's shaped like a whatever, um, that type of thing. Or it can be to say that it's an example of something very typical. This is the ultimate vernacular architecture. This is an example of barns and every barn in this region was built like this. And this is one of three that are still standing. So it can be again, a big story or a little story, um, but the architectural story is one of the types of stories that, that you might consider sharing, that you might consider saying, this is a reason I should be registered. The next type of story is because there is a person or event of significance. Um, so this would be, for example, with the Picto Iron Foundry, this is talking about the, an event and the history of industry in Picto and what does that mean and who worked there and, and how does this building help tell the story. Government House obviously has more people and events of significance than your average building and they could and they would relate all, they would connect to all of them. They might highlight multiple, several of them, but say, you know, as a as a building that has been ser served in this capacity, we have been, at, these are particular things we want to highlight, but our story is much bigger. For this Chibucto school, they have a connection to both the history of education in Halifax, but also were used during the Halifax explosion um, as a clinic and as a morgue. So there they're connecting to a broader story. And then the Height Residence in Hillgrove um, would be an example of a story that's very personal, where this is the story of an individual, and these are the people that live there, and, and their stories matter too. Like I said, the stories that are being told aren't necessarily just, you know, 
premiers and leaders of industries. These can be your stories. This can be about your family house. This can be about how your grandmother served as a midwife or your great grandmother made the best quilts in town or was a school teacher or they were very normal and nothing particularly interesting, but that story matters too. You just have to be able to convey that. Then it can also, another type of story you can tell is about the community more broadly. So for example, the African Nova Scotian community is story is told through the Africa, all of these pictures you're seeing are buildings that are registered. That's just for the record. Um, uh, so telling the story of the African Nova Scotian community, telling the story of the Scots in Iona, could also be telling the story of an organization or a movement like the temperance movement or something related to sport like the curling club. Those are all community stories and you can talk about the role that these buildings played in, in the community at, or as part of that community. The Scottish settlers were a community and they settled here and this is the type of house they built. So those are just some examples. The story you tell about a particular building is probably gonna include a combination of all of them in some way. Um, but just as a way of breaking it down, I wanted to pull apart some of those threads so you could see the levels that we're talking about and the types of the range that, that are being looked at. Okay, so I've convinced you, you're ready. Tomorrow you're gonna go out and find the application. What do you do now? So the first thing you do is you want to look at what level you're going to register. Are you going to apply for municipal registration or provincial registration? And if you don't know where the province, the municipal registration is, I have uh, the Excel sheet, the master Excel sheet with, I believe, every community that's name has ever existed in Nova Scotia and what jurisdiction they're currently in. Um, and I can tell you, there are a few municipalities that don't currently have the ability, they don't currently have a way to register buildings, but I think there's three across the province. So they are the exception, not the rule. And you are more than welcome to say, I want to register municipally and I don't know where. Please shoot me an email. Now, this is the um, slide that I told Sam when we were doing prep was going to scare you all. So I'm just warning you. I apologize. It's going to be less scary than it looks. This is a picture of the laws <laughs> in the province. And this is how a building is registered. It's, I pro swear, it's less complicated than it looks. Basically, you write an application, submit it to, or if you're applying provincially, you email Kevin Barrett, you, the, that the building is registered. Once that goes through, it goes to the Heritage Advisory Committee on the municipal level <clears throat> or the Provincial Advisory Council. They then decide if they're going to recommend it. If it's municipal, it then goes to their council. If it's provincial, it's then suggested to the minister. At that point, the owners of the building, which might mean you, then are given 30 days notice that this has been filed um, and that the recommendation has been filed. And a notice is also filed um, with the Registry of Deeds. At that point, if it's municipal, there's then a notice for a public hearing. Um, and then um, that has to be 21 days in advance, and then it goes to council. If it's provincial, the minister then has 90 days to make a decision. Um, and then finally, it's either approved or denied by, in the province's case, the minister, and in the municipality's case, the council. But to summarize, you write an application, it goes to a committee, the committee then sends a recommendation, and then the recommendation is either approved or denied. If it's approved, you're off to the races. If it's denied, you can always apply again. And just because you're denied by the province or you're denied by a municipality doesn't mean you can't apply for the other type of designation. These systems operate totally separately. I put them on one slide because putting them on two slides seem to make things more complicated. Also, because basically the process is the same. Um, it's just, there's a little fiddly bit as to whether it's the council or the minister who makes the decision. And I hope you are not all scared. Okay, we're gonna have a definition break. Um, in creating this workshop, 
trying to figure out how to get the information I needed to you, as some of you are teachers know, is always a little bit tricky because I don't want to use terms you don't know, but I also want to not interrupt too much. So I'm sort of doing a preemptive moment where we talk about probably the most important term that you are going to need to know in understanding regist heritage registration, whether your building that you're thinking about either is registered or you are thinking about register. So this term is character defining elements. The materials, and this is defined as the materials, forms, location, special configurations, uses and cultural associations or meanings that contribute to the value of a historic place, which must be retained in order to preserve its value. This is a definition that comes from a thing called the standards and guidelines, which we will talk about later. Um, but the character defining elements are basically the things that based on the story you tell, make that building important in a heritage context. So they can be a short list or a long list. And this list then, the list of character defining elements is then gonna guide you throughout the registration life of this building. It's gonna say what can and cannot be altered and in which ways. Anything that's not listed as a character defining element doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter. You can't have the windows and take away the walls, but you have a little bit more leeway with those items. So here are some examples. This is the character defining elements for the Citadel. And I wanted to show you this as an example, partly so you could see that everything that's registered and is a federally registered or provincially registered building gets the same, it's still character defining elements. The Citadel obviously has a lot. Um, and it includes everything from the road leading up to it, to the archaeology, to the shape of it, to how it was changed in the 1930s, to the fact there aren't trees on the hill and it's a great sledding hill. All of that is in the character defining elements of the Citadel. That's the Citadel. This is your more normal list that you get for a small um, house. So as you'll notice, it's a much, much less scary list. It's a much shorter list and it's much more limited. So these are the things that make this house that define this house. So it includes the shape of the roof, the windows, the chimneys, the shape of them, um, that, that there's a barn attached that has wood shingles. It's pretty basic stuff. You'll notice some of the things it doesn't say is what the windows are made of, what the roof is made of, what color it is. All of those things are, are not included in this list. Here's another one. And I want to include this one um, because this is a building that has a business but used to, has changed its use. So it used to be a home, obviously, and now it's a business. Um, and it also includes the one of the def character defining elements is actually the fact is the business name. So as buildings ch uses change, the character defining elements can incorporate elements throughout their entire history. It's not set from when the building was was built. And I think sometimes people worry that if you have a registered building, you have to somehow bring it back to 1820. And that's in no way the case. Again, really simple list. You know, it's how many stories it has, it's the pitch of the roof, it's the fact that there are side lights or windows next to the door, um, and it's the way the, that the door is recessed. So these are not scary lists, they're pretty, they're pretty basic. And as you'll also notice, they're all exterior. I'm not saying this as a rule, but there are very few buildings where the character defining elements our interior, mostly their exterior, when we're talking about registering a building, we're really looking at the envelope, we're looking at the exterior. And we'll get to more into that as we talk about what you can and cannot do if a building is registered. So that's our definition. Hopefully everyone now feels that they have a sense of what the, um, oops, of what character defining elements are, because we're gonna go back to those. Okay. 
This is my other slightly scary diagrammatic slide where I was trying to make visual things that can be complicated because I know some people are more visual. So in Canada, we in the built heritage world are we work under the guidance of the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places. And this is a document that was produced by the federal government. Nova Scotia has adopted it, which means that um, it impacts our laws. It obviously impacts federal heritage laws as well. So it's sort of, it is not law, but it is the thing that, that is the umbrella over, it is the umbrella that, that all built heritage things come under. It's the sky above us, basically. It's the air we breathe. It is also less scary than it looks. So the standards and guidelines, which again is something that is very important and, a use, and useful to understand what it is. So they are not law. They provide guidance around maintenance, conservation, and changes for people working with historic places, including but not limited to heritage buildings. So they also include archaeological sites and, and a landscape, registered landscapes and things like that. Um, they are broad because they have to apply across the country. They apply from Calvert, Newfoundland, all the way up to the Yukon. Um, and like I said, they apply to a lot of different things. So they are quite law, they're quite broad. That means also that they allow for site-specific interpretation, which is really helpful because what's going to work on Parliament Hill and maybe the Citadel is not necessarily going to work on the registered barn um, in Shelburne. They provide practical examples. They do not lay out enforceable law, though laws reference them. They do not prevent safety or accessibility improvements, and they don't prevent the adaptive reuse of a building or changing how you use a building. And those are really important to understand. And these are also the guidelines that build that impact all Parks Canada sites. So if you think about Parks Canada sites that might not have a ramp in an older building, they're allowed to do that because of because as long as it goes under standards and guidelines. There are 14 standards and guidelines related to built heritage, which you should maybe you might be interested in reading. I am not going to list all of them. Um, these are the main what these are sort of the generalized polling parts of them. Um, that one of they say that it's vital to maintain character defining elements. So when in doubt, you go back to your list of character defining elements and you say, how is this change or, or, or shift in the building going to impact that? That it is important to adopt an approach that involves minimal intervention. So you want to do, it's sort of almost like a doctor taking a do no harm approach. You want to try and, and not knock down walls unless you really, really have to. Um, any changes, revisions, and additions should be able to be identifiable as such. Now, this is a very controversial um, aspect and what it means is hotly debated and there is great division as to what it means. So it's important to know it's there. I am not gonna try and define it because that would be going to a quagmire that is well above my pay grade. Um, and also a, the standards and guidelines say you need to document changes that are made. So I always like, and this is because I'm the child of a doctor and to me, the way the healthcare system thinks about things sometimes works. I like to think of the documentation as like the medical record for your building. So you wanna make sure that you know that in 2023, you changed the windows and what you changed them to so that when they get changed again in 2050, they have a record of that. It's useful to know what kind of pain is on the wall. For those of you who come from the museum community, this will all be familiar because, of course, this is the same, the same types of ways that we approach the conservation of objects. Um, you want a record. You always want a record. So just in case, keep that piece of paper. You never know when you're going to need it. So going back to our list, so that's standards and guidelines. That's the air that we breathe when we talk about laws related to built heritage. Then under that, we have actual law and bylaws that come from the province and from the municipalities. So in Nova Scotia, built heritage is governed by the Heritage Property Act, which Sam is going to be putting a link to in the chat. Um, and what this does is it says how you register heritage properties. 
It says how conservation districts can be made. Um, it says how things are protected when they're provincially registered. Um, it allows for there to be money for grants for registration. And it dictates, of course, the punishment if you break those rules. Um, the Reed House, of course, is an example of a place where the law is slowly working its way, it's working its way through the law, but the people have charges under Heritage Property Act. So that's the law that we do. And it also lays out the way the municipal, the framework for the municipal laws. So when I showed you that chart showing this is what happens with municipal, that comes from the Heritage Property Act. The municipalities can adopt them, but they have, but at minimum, that's the framework and it comes from that. I am going to touch on federal heritage acts briefly, and the reason I'm doing this is because some of you may be involved in heritage lighthouses or railroads, um, which of course can be federally owned or not, um, and those are impacted by federal law as well as provincial law, so it's useful to just have in your head that these two laws exist, as well as the Historic Sites and Monuments Act. So the Historic Sites and Monuments Act is the overarching document that allows for federal designations. Um, it allows for the creation of museums. Um, then the Heritage Lighthouse Protection Act preserve works to protect lighthouses, shockingly enough, and talks about how they'll be disposed. And the Railroads Act, Railway Stations Act is basically the same thing for railway stations. Um, currently, um, Bill C-23 is working its way through Parliament. That would change these laws. So I also don't want to spend too much time on them because they might all be tweaked and adjusted. But you should be aware that they exist in case it's useful information. Try to be a little all-encompassing. Okay. I'm just going to see how we're doing for time. Oh, I'm not running hugely over yet. Great. So... Part of the reason this workshop was developed is because I've heard from people, including some people I believe are in the room, that there are a lot of myths around heritage registration. Um, and I've heard it from lots and lots of people. So I thought I would go through the four big ones that I'm aware of. So the first one is that registered heritage buildings can't be updated to modern standards. Just because your building is registered doesn't mean we expect you to use an outhouse and heat your house with coal and wood. That would be silly. Um, they, can't, they aren't frozen in time. The expectation is that just as any non-registered building, registered buildings can evolve. You can get a heat pump. You can get a refrigerator. You can paint your house. All of these things are perfectly acceptable. The character defining elements and the envelope is usually the things that you have to be conscious of. So for example, if you have a registered heritage building and your heat, you wanna put your heat pump, you probably, you can't, you can't put it in a place that's gonna, you know, knock out that lovely side light next to your door if this listed as a, hair, as a character defining element. You should stick it around back, please. Um, you can add ramps, you can do all of these things. They aren't stuck in time. You should double, with the character defining elements, if you're doing something to the exterior, you just usually need to double check with your heritage, the relevant heritage office in your municipality or Kevin Barrett's office at the province, and they'll tell you, yes, no, please tweak it slightly to the left. Um, knowing those character defining elements, which are listed, which are registered with the Registry of Deeds, you work with that. And as you saw, they're usually not very long and they're usually, you know, they're workable. There, nobody's, nobody is here to make life difficult. Registered buildings can't be made physically accessible. Oh, and I want to say the reason I'm using Parliament, obviously, Parliament Center Block is a registered building. They are doing all kinds of crazy construction there to bring it up to modern standards. They're just working within the character defining elements. Registered buildings can't be made physically accessible. This is one that is near and dear to my heart because actually the building that you are seeing is my mother's building. My mother lives in New York City, not in Nova Scotia, but she lives in a heritage district and deals with very similar laws. My mother has a mobility issue and can't get into her build, couldn't get into her building, so she needed a ramp. This was a solution. This little lovely little ramp. 
Um, and the lovely little ramp does not get in the way of the beautiful door with its beautiful details. They had to add a lift because there are stairs inside that you can't see. Again, it doesn't impact the character defining elements of her building. It, if you walk by, you wouldn't necessarily even notice it. It also, again, going back to that tricky thing about different, but the visibly different, but the same, it is made of slightly different material. If you look closely, you can tell it's a modern add-on. But just because it's registered doesn't mean you can't add a wrap, ramp or a lift or whatever. People are doing really creative and exciting things to make older buildings function according to accessibility laws. The local council of women's house in Halifax, which some of you may know has a ramp. They also just redid their washroom to make it accessible, their registered building. Really cool creative stuff going on. Similarly, you can't, you can do things that make them rain. You can add solar panels. You can do all of the same, you can do a lot of the same stuff. You just have to keep track of your character defining elements. And also they're green to begin with. So, and I am always happy to talk about these issues if issues are on accessibility and heritage building, because as I've said, they're near and dear to my heart. And I also think that's just a really cool solution. I was really excited to finally see it after four years when I got to go home at Christmas. I had heard tell. All right, next myth. Registered buildings can't be insured. This is a tricky one. Um, we know that the insurance industry does not necessarily love registered heritage buildings, and they really struggle to understand them. However, this is not because of any thing other than mis the insurance industry not really getting what a heritage building is. And there really isn't a difference between a heritage build, registered building, heritage building and a non-registered heritage building. Um, as an organization, we are working with Kevin Barrett and also partners at the national level to work with the insurers to try and, and get there to be better understanding. Um, it's a national problem. If you are experiencing issues with insurance, please call our office or call Kevin Barrett's office. Let us know. We are tracking it we have contacts in the insurance industry. Also, it's really insurance, it's it's not you can't be insured, it's just you need to talk to the right person. There are in fact insurance companies who work almost exclusively on heritage buildings. Unfortunately, the best one, Ecclesiastical, who some of you might be familiar with because they're funding the next great save, um, doesn't do residential buildings, but they do do institutional buildings. Um, and so, you know, there are there are options out there and we will help you find them. And we also do know that this is a big issue, um, but it's not a reason not to register. It's a reason to call us if you're thinking of registering and you've talked to your insurer and they've made unhappy noises. We will work with you. The province will work with you. Our friends in the insurance industry will work with you. Don't be scared by this. Any comfort, I'm going to try and register my building, and I trust me, I'm not going to stand still until they try and take away my insurance. The last one registration myth we're going to touch base on is that registered buildings need specialized tradespeople for any kind of fixes. Have your favorite tradesperson make your fixes. Most of the time, fixes can be done by anyone who's qualified in the relevant qualified trade. In some cases, you might need a specialist. Um, but that's going to be true with any kinds of issues that you might have with the house. The registration is no different than that or the building. Um, if it's a character defining element you're mucking around with, you might be more inclined. But again, a carpenter doesn't need to be a specialist to be a great carpenter. If you're trying to fix those issues, you just need to find someone who knows how to fix them. I did choose a picture from a workshop in Newfoundland. This is a specialist working on, as you can see, quite special windows. But again, they're special windows. Um, those are not windows you see every day. Um, so that is something that you shouldn't worry about. Your regular plumber you've been working with for years, you know, these are things, you know, sometimes you'll just have to work with them, maybe on sourcing some materials if it's a character defining element, but but work with the guys you trust. Um, I will also say one of my favorite questions I've gotten since I got to this job was something asking if there were people who specialized in pest removal in heritage buildings just in a residence and no, there aren't. Anyone who works on rodent control in Nova Scotia has probably dealt with the odd heritage building here or there. We as an organization, unfortunately, can't give out specific names, but ask your friends and neighbors, they can. We just can't endorse anyone at this point. We're working on a way to figure that out. But um, 
We know we know, we get those calls a lot. So I'm trying to preempt them. But there are people in the province who can do this. Find the guys who are good, the women who are good. You'll be fine. All right. Is that my last one? Now our bottom line. And Sam is going to put our evaluation in the chat and the six other things he's supposed to put in the chat right now, I think. Um, so the bottom line is that registering a heritage building helps protect our stories and protects the buildings and the stories they tell and their economic benefits to the community and they're green and we want to keep them around and registering really, really helps. Registering a building as a heritage building does not dramatically limit changes that can be made. Just keep an eye on those character defining elements and make sure that they're respected. Most of them are going to be things that as someone who cares about that building you care about anyway, they're not going to be things that, you know, are totally radically wacky. Um, they're probably the things that make that building special to you anyway. So they're not going to come from out of space. They're going to be based on those stories that you're telling. The process is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you just, you, you contact your local heritage um, Mini and or you contact Kevin Barrett's office if you're looking for provincial registration and I am here to help. I'm in the office almost every day. Nine to four is usually the best time to reach me. I respond to emails, phone calls, whatever you may have it. My job is is to help you um, and to work and help keep these buildings alive and kicking. If you are in more of an advocacy position in your community, I can also help with that. Um, Please don't be scared by registering. Please don't be scared by living in a registered building, as I'm sure some of you do. Um, they, they really are wonderful. Um, and it's a wonderful system we have that allows us to work and preserve, um, the, preserve these structures, whether or not they are 200 years old or whether or not they're 50 years old. Um, you know, this is how we get that wonderful mix that when we visit other cities we love is that there's this lovely mix of different generations and registering them and making sure that we register buildings, whatever their age, as long as they're past that 50 year mark, really keeps, allows our building to have sort of the diversity and wonderfulness that you see when you go into a garden and you see different plants blooming at different times. So I will get rid of my share screen. And if you have questions and you want to put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A, I will be happy to answer them. Um, I'm seeing one. I'm going to just start with the two that came up. So um, Emery asked about the tearing down in three years. So it starts from when the building was purchased by its most recent owner. Um, for example, the, the the example on the top of everyone's tongue, at least in HRM, is the Edward Street house that Dow bought. Um, so they can, it has now been registered by approved for registration. They can now wait and in three years they can tear it down. Um, you can also tear it sort of demo, they can, they're also doing a process that is called demolition by neglect at the same time. But yeah, you just have to wait for three years. So a developer could buy up a building that's registered and they just have to wait three years. Um, so it's a law that really needs to be changed. It's one that we've brought to the ministers. It's one we've brought to, to other members of, of the legislature and say this is something that's a real problem. Um, because it's also at the National Trust for Canada's conference um, in, in Toronto. It was one of uh, our, all the Nova Scotians' party trick is that our law is worse than your law. Um, so, so that's the answer to that. Uh, Lori, you are a nonprofit operating out of a heritage building. It's a former school. Um, I'm just gonna read your, I'm sorry, I'm gonna read this. Uh, it's a, do, 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 do. So what are your options? Um, you need to look at your character defining elements. I'm guessing those windows are, um, so Lori's asking about the cost prohibitiveness of <clears throat> replacing windows in a school building. I hope I'm getting this right and summarizing correctly. And that's very tricky. So um, the answer is it really, um, uh, really, 
it depends on what your character defining elements is. I would suggest talking to your local heritage officer. If you're registered as a provincial site, you want to call Kevin Barrett's office. If it's municipally registered, you want to call um, your heritage advisory council and they'll be and talk to them and say, this is what our character defining elements are. This is what we are. These are seem to be the logical options that we can the, the logical options for us. Um, and then hopefully you can find something that meets the needs of the character defining elements and also hits that. But that's also a place where you can apply to a grant for us um, and we can help with support for that. That's the type of grants that we get every single month are grants for helping with projects like that. We don't generally aren't usually able to fulfill full projects. Um, but if it's an efficiency issue, again, you can apply to, you can look for other funding sources. And if you want to shoot me an email or give me a call, um, I'm happy to talk to you about what some might be available. Um, but you also should go back to that heritage officer. And Linda Forbes, I'm assuming, corrected me. Sorry, it's it's the demolition. It's tied to the, oh, it's from the date of demolition, um, not the date of purchase. That something can be, which of course makes sense because when you buy something, you don't say, hi, I'm buying it to demolish it. Um, so Linda is clarifying. So the ownership can change during that three-year period. Once the three years and the demolition or alteration has to be done within a year. So it, the demolition permit, you can basically get a demolition permit and then sell it on again. The demolition permit still is in effect. The bottom line though, is that if, if a building is registered as a municipal level, it has very little protection. If the buyer want, if a new buyer, if you, you want to protect it and you sell it to someone and they want to demolish it. Are there other questions? I don't believe you. I know Katie has questions. She's just being quiet is my guess. Because I know she's there's a bunch of issues down in Shelburne that are helping. Who else can I bug? I don't have an opinion on steel roofing other than I find it interesting that in place, some parts of the community, it seems like the blue was going on sale at one point. It, I, I think that my job as a her in this position is to not have aesthetic opinions <laughs> and to have value judgments. If you are looking at a heritage building that's registered, that is already registered, or you want to register it, and one of the character defining elements has been defined, or you would like to be defined as connected to the material associated with your roof, you might have issues if you want to switch to steel roofing. There is no, it really depends on how your character defining elements are done, or whether or not diminishes the story. To me, I don't think that in, there's anything inherently wrong with steel roofing because I think that the shift to steel roofing is a really interesting architectural development, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, where we see it all the time on these older buildings. So to me, it adds to the story, but that's sort of neither here nor there. It really comes down to what are the character defining elements when something is registered or what is the story that you are proposing? If you have a 19th century barn and you say, okay, we want to steel roof because we're sick of our roof blowing off in hurricanes and this is getting ridiculous. And then two years down the road, you say, oh, we want to register. And the steel roof is that, or a year down the roof, or in six months, you can sort of say, well, part of our story is that the evolution of our barn is that the roof kept blowing off, right? If somebody asks you about it. But my guess is the story of that barn has very little to do with the roof. It might have to do with the angle of the roof and the fact that barns in that community are built like this because of their connection to this or that cultural community. But I don't think it really matters. Um, you know, it, but again, I was talking to, to one of our board members and saying the difference between being a, 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 a community member versus being having endless amounts of training in this is that I have learned to repress all aesthetic opinions when it comes to these things. Um, you know, I'm interested in the story. I'm interested in how do we preserve these stories. I'm interested in trying to make sure they last. I don't want people's roofs blowing off because then they don't last. But I also would like, you know, and then you look at where someone's at or where an organization is at or where their budget is at. 
It's the same question about windows. You know, older windows can be incredibly energy efficient, and certainly their production is way more energy efficient than modern buildings that have all these new chemicals in them. In the end, that's sort of neither here nor there. If your organization has a heat bill that's going through the roof and you need this now, and that's what's available. So I think there's a level on which these questions of heritage registration is it's very simple. Um, what's the story? How do we want to, how, what's the story? How do I convey that? Can I get the, the province or the municipality to say, yes, your story matters? On the other hand, it's very complicated because every building has very complex histories. The building I'm sitting in right now is from the early 19th century. Um, it's our offices at the corner of Octorloney Street and King Street in, in Dartmouth. And if the people who built this house building walked in, they wouldn't recognize it. But from the outside, they might see some elements that are similar to how it used to look. That to me is a great story because it talks about how we're able to preserve this history and we can talk about this building and its evolution and all of its different uses. And that's what that's what registration gets you is it buys you all this extra time for that building and it buys you the money and the grants and it gives you access to be able to preserve in whatever way possible. Um, and there's so much support out there. Like I'm looking around at this list and I know there are so many people in this room who have so much knowledge and who work at nonprofits and work at museums who could help you do the research, you know, who could help you find those stories. And certainly I am always happy to answer phone calls and emails. Um, talking to you guys is by far my favorite part of my job. Um, and as you can see, I like to talk. Good thing Dee Meisner isn't here. She'd be yelling at me, telling me I should shush and listen. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yeah, um, there are some really great responses going on in the chat too about suggestions. Um, the one thing is that with the grants, um, because most of the grants around registered sites are based on the registration, sometimes they can help you then snowball them. And, you know, if you're able, we know that we had a proposal for some work being done on site that we didn't approve because it wasn't quite in sticking with the character defining elements. Um, but the amount of time in the, when we said that they went and realized that that if we did give them the grant, they would then have enough money to get a better, get the product that was more in line and actually that would last them longer. So, you know, calling the granting organizations, calling us, calling the province, depending on what municipality they're in, there's a lot of grants available for registered sites in a bunch of municipalities. You know, sometimes that can make that budget difference. Our organization does give grants to individuals, not just nonprofits. So if you have a registered heritage home or you're thinking of registering. Um, so, you know, there's lots of options available and windows are tricky. Um, I know that my house has the original 1930s windows and that currently are painted shut and I'm terrified to try and shut them away and I need to get someone to go in and, and keep and to do that work um, because I want to keep my original windows because it's to me a character defining element of my house. Um, whether or not we ever convince anyone to let us register our little 1930s house in Fairview, we'll see. You are all, any other questions out there? Well, our hope is that we'll be on the road um, this summer, current tentative plan is the end of summer, August, September, current tentative plan is probably heading to the Pictoanaganish area, not, not guaranteeing anything yet, but that's currently the tentative plan, and then every year we will rove so that we'll, we'll be traveling around. Um, you notice that there are two persons on the Provincial Heritage Advisory Camp. I don't know, Megan. But um, an email to Kevin would probably answer that. He's usually pretty good um, at responding. I know that things are moving forward because I talk to him pretty regularly. Um, 
I think I don't think it's slowing things down any more than they're already slowed by the normal way of the world and having only a one Kevin in that office. Um, but shooting him an email, he could probably let you know. Um, I'll stay on. And if folks want to ask me questions with your voice on, you're welcome to. I can hang out for a bit. Um, I'm sorry we don't have coffee and cake. When we do this in person, I promise there will be coffee and cake. But have a great night and we'll get we'll send out um, if you do our little evaluation, there's a place for the feedback form. Sam just posted it again. Um, you can stick your email in there and we will be sure to let you know when we when we do our roadshow version of this, when we will be able to delve in much deeper to the read to the municipal laws for that region.